walk with me. Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me while I'm on this Christian journey. I need you, Lord, to walk with me and talk with me, Lord, talk with me, talk with me, Lord, talk with me while I'm on this Christian journey. I need you, Lord, to talk with me and take my hand, Lord, take my hand, take my hand, Lord, take my hand while I'm on this Christian journey. I need you, Lord, to take my hand. Lead me home, Lord. Lead me home. Lead me home, Lord. Lead me home. While I'm on this Christian journey, I need you, Lord, to lead me home while I'm on this Christian journey. I need you, Lord, to lead me home. Just a closer walk with me. Grant it, Jesus, this my plea. Daily walking close to me. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Thou art strong, Jesus, keep me from all wrong, and I'll be satisfied as long as I walk, let me walk close to Thee. world of toils and snares if I falter Lord who cares who with me my burden share none but thee dear Lord none but thee just a closer walk with thee grant it Jesus this my plea daily walking close to thee let it be dear God let it be And when my feeble life is o'er And time for me will be no more Guide me gently, safely, oh To thy kingdom, dear Lord, to thy shore and just a closer walk with thee. Grant 
Dear Jesus, this my plea. Daily walking close to Thee. Oh, let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Daily walking close to Thee. Let it be. Dear Lord, let it be. Well, Father, we thank you for this time together. Lord, seems like you're always putting us in situations that we're never quite prepared for. But because you're with us, Lord, we can go through them. <laughs> we can have confidence. We can have assurance. And we can have a peace, Lord, knowing that you're with us through everything. And Father, today, as I was calling upon your name to be about my business, you reminded me, Father, that I should be grateful and feel privileged to be about yours. Thank you, Lord, for this day and for all days, Father. And be with us now as we continue to go through this a uh, time of praise and worship in Jesus' name. Amen. i do one more here, and then we'll let Jackie get up here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try this song. It's been a while. Yes. Take up your cross and follow me, I heard my master say. I gave my all to ransom thee, surrender your all today. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. And wherever he leads, I'll go. I drew me closer to his side. His will I sought to know. And in that will I now abide, and wherever he leads I'll go. Wherever he leads I'll go. Wherever he leads I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. And wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so and wherever he leads I'll go Heavenly Father once again we just thank you for this time together and as short as it is Father I pray that you would uh, give us ears to hear eyes to see uh, a heart to receive and a will to obey as Jackie brings us the word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Leads, I'll go. <laughs> That's good, Rick. You could have done a few more. I was fine. I see Jordan never gives me this much time to preach, so...
Oh, yeah, he's there seeing uh, I Am Barabbas. That's not the name of it. it was, that's the name of the song. I'm old, so I don't remember band names anymore. Something young. Grr. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 6, so this is probably, <laughs> this is the chapter I get in the most trouble in, in the book of Genesis. Uh, and this section is where I'm going to sound the most like that show, um, Ancient Aliens. You guys ever seen that show? No? Yeah. So Genesis chapter 6 is kind of a really uh, uh, cool four verses. Um, after those four verses, we, we start moving toward the flood. So but these first four verses we will we'll look at tonight. This is the uh, pre-flood circumstances, Genesis chapter 6. And this is the section, if we look at the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Sorry, I'm echoing. Woo, woo, woo. I don't know where you guys want me to put this, this new shindig. We good? <laughs> okay. I still up here go sounding like a UFO. Maybe. Maybe there's a reason. So, first 11 chapters of Genesis deal with the fall of man. All 11 chapters. We see creation, chapters 1 and 2. The fall of man, chapter 3. Chapter 4, we have the first murder. Chapter 5, we have... The beginning of a battle you're going to see played out on the pages of Scripture all the way through between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, the promised seed of Messiah, and Satan's rebellious crew looking to stop uh, the birth of Messiah, the, the opportunity of Messiah to come. So that's a battle that you see played out. And tonight is a, a really uh, exciting section in regard to that. This is focused on the corruption of man. How was man corrupted? More than the fall, more than his rebellion, uh, now we see uh, his corruption. So Chuck Missler, a long time ago when I was a young person, I was probably, gosh, I don't know, was I, I might have been 20-something, and Chuck, Chuck Missler went through Genesis 6 and blew my mind. And so ever since then, Genesis 6 has been kind of a cool uh, study for me. We'll take a look at some interesting things tonight as we work our way through it. So uh, let's jump in. Genesis 6, verse 1 and 2. So when man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to him, the sons of God saw the daughters of men were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Now, on the face, it doesn't seem like a big deal. Oh, for Debbie, this is the woohoo interpretation, just so you know. Mark wanted me to make sure I said it's the woohoo interpretation. The sons of God looked at the women and said woohoo. So... So on the, on the face, there's, there's not a lot of things. And whenever I come to sections like this about Scripture, I did this when we went through Matthew 24 about a year ago, um, I asked the same question. Do you want the truth or do you want certainty? Because when we look at it, I'm going to tell you there are other systems that take all the supernatural stuff out. So they'll say this. It's the sons of Seth and the daughters of Cain. It's good people marrying bad people. And somehow their children were giants, which I think creates a problem anyways. But there is also just what it says. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time just so you guys can see what it says. Number one, population was increasing, right? It says in the very beginning that when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. So population is increasing. Dr. Henry Morris, who wrote a book on Genesis called the Genesis Record, uh, he estimates the numbers of mankind prior to the flood to be over 2 million people. So, and he just does that by 
uh, doing an equation based on how long people lived, how many children they could have, and, uh, um, and, and tabulating the results of that. He comes up with the uh, population of the world at that time. It's a lot less than today, but the population of the world at that time would be around 2 million people. So number one, population is increasing. And when there's more people, guess what? There's more problems. So the second thing we're introduced to is that daughters are being born to them. So it emphasizes the, the young ladies who are part of the uh, obviously 50% roughly of the race of mankind at the time. Is that Joe calling me? I could answer if you want. <laughs> I never know the words he's going to say when I say hello. Okay, then we have, then we're introduced to this phrase, the sons of God. So we ask ourselves some questions about who are these sons of God and what does it mean that they saw the daughters who were attractive and they took uh, as their wives any they chose now maybe that seems pretty simple let's look at verse 3 in verse 3 the Lord speaks judgment so in verse 3 he says my spirit shall not abide in man forever he is flesh his days shall be a hundred and twenty years so whatever happens in verse 1 and 2 is a precursor to God's judgment in verse 3. Now, I want you to also understand there is difficulty always in translating from an, one language to another language. And I challenge people by telling them when you study, use multiple translations because when you do, you'll recognize when a verse says something totally different in two different translations, what that means is this is not easy to translate. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but when I worked at a, a egg ranch, you guys know what an egg ranch is? I worked at an egg ranch, which is wrangling chickens, which we didn't have to wrangle because they were all in cages. But um, everybody that I worked with was uh, Mexican. And they all spoke Spanish. And I'm the only white guy in the whole place. And every day we get together for lunch, we sit down for lunch, and I'd sit in a big crowd of them, and they'd all start laughing. Now, maybe they're just laughing at me, which is possible. But I would ask, what are you guys laughing at? And they, oh, he told a joke. And I was like, oh, tell me the joke. And they'd say, it doesn't translate. If I tell it to you in English, it's not funny. There is... There is always difficulty getting nuance of language from one language to another. It's always that way. So when we look at this phrase of God's judgment, uh, I got four different translations. I'm just going to read for you so you can see where they're trying to, to work out exactly what's going on. In uh, ESV, obviously, it says, My spirit shall not abide in man forever. Uh, in New King James, it says, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. Uh, in the Septuagint, I thought it was interesting to go into the Septuagint, which is the earliest translation of the Hebrew scriptures in 270 B.C. So that was a long time ago. The Lord God said, my breath will not at all reside in these humans for very long. So that's the Septuagint. Then there's a... Uh, a, a version of the Masoretic that reads like this, and the Lord God said, my spirit shall certainly not remain among these men forever because they are flesh. So the reference that he gives in this judgment is so there's something God is removing from or taking away from man, and he's doing it because he is flesh. He's sinful. He's not spiritual. He is, he is lost. And then he says something to the effect of his days will be 120 years. Now, people talk about this all the time. Does that mean he's only going to live for 120 years? So some people will say that 120 years is a biblical life expectancy. So prior to now, men have been living 900 years. You're going to see in the upcoming chapters the, the, the years of his life shorten and shorten and shorten. Uh, until we see where we are today. That's possible. 
Other people say that he's giving a time, this is what I think, he's giving a time reference, which is 120 years to the flood. So the, so the Lord is declaring judgment coming. He doesn't say what that judgment is. Now, in the next few verses, he's going to talk to Noah and tell Noah what's going on. But that's what I think he's referring to. So, verses 1 and 2, whatever happened in those simple sentences brought God's judgment and was a precursor to the flood. All right? So, just want you to keep that in your mind by the time we get to verse 4 and we spice things up a little bit. So, verse 4, it says, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. So there's an argument about the Nephilim, what it means. Some will say it means fallen ones. Others will say it means giants. If you look in your Bibles, you'll see that reference. In those days, there were giants. Other ones, yeah, just like you, Jared. And other ones will say, other ones will say Nephilim or fallen ones. Um, what we're going to see in the biblical text, and what you guys will see as we go through the Old Testament is going to, this is some of the interesting things, you're going to see a battle between God's people and giants. You, for example, what's the easiest one to think of? Goliath. David and Goliath, right? That's really easy. You remember before David when you have Caleb and Joshua coming into the promised land, you remember what Caleb asked for? He says, send me to the mountain where the Anakim are, that's where the giants are, I want to conquer them. So you, and you have God commanding Joshua and Moses to be at war with the giant clans. So now people say, come on. They're really giants. Maybe they're just giant in wickedness. Well, I don't know. Maybe they are giants in wickedness. But all I know is David fought a giant. Og of Bashan was a big dude. We're going to look at the scriptures tonight. So there was something that occurred in the race of man that developed a clan of giants that stayed together and went by the names Anakim and Rephaim. Now those are interesting names in the Hebrew because those names are names that speak of not being um, um, uh, relatives of the giants and uh, Rephaim is a special note of like uh, spiritually evil. Rephaim is almost like the word zombie. So it's weird, but the Bible talks about the valley of the Rephaim. You go, those of us who have been reading through the Bible, we've read some of this already, and there's more to come. So there is a race. Now here's what I want you to, to understand. These, whatever this Nephilim is, they are constantly at war with God's plan. So also I want you to see this. There were Nephilim in those days before the flood. And what else does it say? And also after. So they don't, they, they somehow they either survive the flood or something else happens. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as we kind of develop the idea. So let's look at it again. Verse 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. And then he tells us what, what do these Nephilim have to do with? When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bore them children, these were Giborim. Giborim is mighty men. Giborim is a Gibor is a word often used of God. Describing God as the mighty God, Gibor, Giborim, the mighty people. Um, so these were the mighty men who were of old. And then he uses the phrase, men of renown. Let me say it like this. Men of legend. Men of the stories. So let's think about it a little bit and we'll, we'll dive in and take a look. So first question we, we need to wrestle with is who is or are the sons of God. The word is bene, that means son. Cha means the. And Elohim means God. 
So bene ha Elohim. Now the ha doesn't translate in English. You wouldn't say sons of the God. We would just say sons of God. You guys tracking with me? So the plural word in the phrase is the word Elohim. Elohim is a plural. That's where we get the the the, the plural um, aspect of it. It is translated by the Septuagint. Which, remember I told you that's a translation that goes back to 270 B.C. It's translated as angels. The sons of God in the Septuagint is translated as angels. In the Old Testament, we're going to look at the references in just a minute. In the Old Testament, it is only ever used of spiritual beings. The word Elohim can refer to God himself. The word Elohim can refer to an angel. The word Elohim can refer to the, a dead, a, a man who died and went to heaven, let's say. Um, you guys will remember the story of the witch of uh, Endor. You guys remember the story of the witch of Endor? The witch of Endor is, is Saul wants to hear from Samuel. Samuel had died. And so when she goes... To call forward a spirit. You guys remember the story? Yes or no? So she goes to call forward the spirit and Samuel really shows up. And it freaks her out and she realizes you must be Saul because Samuel wouldn't, call, wouldn't have come for me. So, right? And he is called an Elohim. Now, translated in English, spirit. But the point is, I want you to understand how that word is used. But it's only ever used of spiritual beings. Now, there's hopefully I can tie all this stuff together. So the sons of God, always spiritual beings, and almost always in the Old Testament referring to angels. Almost always referring to angels. So let's look at a few of those. Uh, oh, there's so many. Uh, Psalm 29.1. Psalm 29.1 says, Ascribe to the Lord... And then if you have the ESV, it says this phrase, O heavenly beings, which is bene ha Elohim. So what it says, the truth of what it says is sons of God. So now, what, what it, the ESV is trying to help you. Who, who is this sons of God referring to? Heavenly beings, right? So ascribe to the Lord. O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Psalm 82 has it a couple of times. Psalm 82, verse 1. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. In the midst of the gods. The, the phrase there is Elohim, but it's not God. It is the heavenly beings. So the Lord sits in his council Who's in his council in the heavens? The angels. So he sits in the midst of his council with the angels. In fact, Psalm 82, he's judging the angels. You'll see it again. Verse 6. Um, Psalm 82, verse 6. I said, you are God's sons of the Most High, all of you. Bene, ha, elion, elion. Same phrase, the last word's different. Elion means most high. Instead of Benecha Elohim, which would be sons of God, sons of the most high. So again, referencing, uh, I believe, to angels. Job 1.6, now there was a day, Don knew this one. Now there was a day when the Benecha Elohim, the sons of God, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came with them. So all the angels are coming before the Lord for formation. They're all showing up for whatever their responsibilities are for that day. And Satan, the accuser, came with them. So again, they're referencing angels. Job 2.1 says, Now again, there was a day uh, when the sons of God came to present themselves uh, before the Lord, and Satan also came among them and presented himself to the Lord. That's the second time. Same thing, Beni Elohim, the sons of God, angels coming before the Lord. And um, the, the final, I'm going to do one more reference after this, but the final reference, Job 
38, 7 says, Now when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. That's, he's talking about creation. And the angels celebrating as the Lord is creating the heavens and the earth. So every time it's referenced, it is referenced toward at minimum heavenly beings and probably most often angels. Angels, angels everywhere, angels. Now, if this is angels, we have some questions, don't we? Because we're going to go, how does that work? Okay, this is why I say truth or certainty. Because we can change it and say, well, here it doesn't mean sons of God. It really means men. And it's just different men that come together. And now we don't have to deal with the hassle of figuring out how does this work. So I think the fun is in trying to figure out how does this work? So for me, the truth is, this is what the Bible says. Now there's one more reference that I want us to look at. We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Uh, Dan brought this one up earlier today in our Marco group. Deuteronomy 32. We'll just pick it up in verse 7. This is the song of Moses. If you're reading uh, the one your Bible with this, you've done this. So, um, so picking it up in verse 7, it says, Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations, and ask your father, he will show you, your elders, and they will tell you, when the Most Highs gave to the nations their inheritance. So here's what he's singing about. We haven't got there yet because we're in Genesis 6. In Genesis 11, there's another event called the Tower of Babel. You guys familiar with the story? In the Tower of Babel, all men are, are unified in one uh, act of rebellion against God. And they're building a tower into the heavens. And the Lord confuses their speech. We remember the story? And so it causes all men, instead of being unified in one language... Wang, <sighs> words are hard. Instead of being one language and one effort to accomplish something, it divides men into uh, nations. That's where the nation, the, the, the division of nations comes from. So, I know, it's, it's even, can you imagine if, it, if I had your problems? It'd be even worse. Yeah, it'd be even worse. So, um, so this is what he's referring to in Deuteronomy 32. Listen to what he says. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance. So it is God in heaven, the God in heaven over all the earth, who decided where nations would settle. Now, for us, it looks like they just randomly go wherever they go, and then that becomes their land, and this becomes their land, and this becomes their land. So it, the Lord is saying, I set all those boundaries for all the nations. It says, when he, God, divided mankind... He fixed the borders of the peoples of all the nations according to the sons of God. Now, even the ESV wants to do this. There'll be a little footnote in your Bible, and it'll say, well, what he means by the sons of God is the sons of Israel. So here's why that's a problem for you if you're a thinking person. There is no sons of Israel yet. And there is nobody. What in the world? Do, do the sons of Israel control the borders of every nation on earth? No. But who could? Who could control the boundaries of all the nations on earth? Exactly what it says. The Bene Elohim. Now here's what I'm going to put forth. The sons of God. So angels were given, Psalm 80, 82, Psalm 82 is a direct judgment of God against these angels for what they did. You and I know that there's a fallen angel. What's his name? Satan. Satan. Is he the only angel who ever fell? Okay, so in the creation of angels, which you and I are not familiar with, right? We know very little about angels. We know a little bit, you know, the Bible says, be careful to enter entertain strangers for some of you have entertained angels unaware, right? Yes. 
So, so the Bible tells us to be hospitable to the foreigner. And so we, we look at it. Now, what the Bible is teaching in Deuteronomy 32.8 is that when the nations were divided at the Tower of Babel, God put angels over the nations to be a, a controlling factor to that nation. Now, that doesn't mean they showed themselves to nations. It doesn't mean that they didn't. It just means angels had responsibility for man. And God says, this is the important part, God says in the very next verse, but the Lord's portion is his people and Jacob his allotted heritage. What did God do in Genesis chapter 12? He gave all the nations for the angels to manage like stewards, much like he gives us authority to manage families and so forth. That for which we'll give an answer, right? For our stewardship. He gave angels stewardship over the nations. And then he took his own Abraham. And he says, now from Abraham, I'm going to build a nation that's going to bring all the other nations to me. Okay, is everybody tracking with me? Now here's what I want you to understand. Some of those angels that were over the nations, uh, depending on what number you go by, you could go by 70 nations or 72. The angels over those nations, I think, showed themselves to the nations. And all those nations began to worship them as gods. Now think about it with me. Now you have angels who are choosing to rebel against God, and uh, are angels who are rebelling against God and are leading man in corruption, teaching man things he didn't know yet. For example, how'd they do the pyramids? How did they do the, th- how did the ancient man do the things ancient man did? Now, there's a lot of people out there, and you may think they're kooks, and you may think I'm a kook after this, too. It's fine. People have thought worse things of me, that's for sure. Uh, But one of the things that is gaining popularity is the idea that there was some contact with something otherworldly that taught that. Let me ask you a question. Why are there pyramids on every continent? Did you know there are pyramids in the United States? Do you know that I did not know that? And somebody told me, oh, yeah, there's pyramids in the United States. I said, uh-uh. How's there pyramids here? And I don't know about no pyramids in the United States. Yeah. Go home and Google it and have your mind blown. So you have pyramids all now. I'm not trying to say beyond a shadow of a doubt the Bible says the angels taught them that. I'm just saying Genesis 6 touches on that. For example, maybe some of you have heard of a little known book called the Book of Enoch. Anybody ever heard of the Book of Enoch? Don't, please don't go crazy. Every time I talk about the Book of Enoch, I get a little afraid. So the Book of Enoch is not the Bible. The Book of Enoch is mentioned, is, was written in the second temple period. The book of Enoch was written uh, just before Jesus was born. What we're reading in Genesis 6 is a long time before that. Okay? You guys with me? But what the book of Enoch does explain is how men at, and how, how the thinkers of Israel thought about Genesis 6 in their day. So you know what they thought happened? They thought that the angels came down, showed themselves to man. They're the, they become the foundation for what will become Baal worship. Have you guys read through the Old Testament and you hear about people worshiping Baal or Ashtoreth or any of the other gods that they, that they became the source of that? Now, how would that work? Let's say ancient man sees an angel. Well, let me ask you, what was the work for you? Well, let me ask you this. How'd it work for Joseph Smith? 
oh, wait, 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 let's not talk about that. Let's say, instead of Joseph Smith, how did it work for Muhammad? Sure, so I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that we should accept what they say, but I am saying there's a lot of stories about how angels have interfered with men, and the result has been worship, false worship, false worship. So here in Genesis 6, we begin to, we begin to see some of these things going on. Now, now, that's not the only references we have. We have two references in Peter, and we have a reference in Jude. So in 2 Peter, New Testament references, 2 Peter, Peter knew the story. 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, says this, A false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, and they will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation uh, from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Listen, verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell... And committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, and seven others when he brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ash, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. If he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that uh, righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormented. Uh, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial and keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Now think about that. And we look at Jude. Jude, the brother of Jesus, he also wrote about it. Jude, verses 5 and 7. Jude says, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling... He has reserved in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. In both places, you have a reference of the judgment of the angels and an example of Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Why connect those dots? There's lots of examples of judgment. Why connect those? Because those dots uh, both have to deal with Sexual immorality, I would say, not holding their proper domain. So, all scholars agree on this point. Whatever happens in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, uh, is the precursor and episode leading to the flood of Noah. And the appearance is that this is uh, a time in which angels sinned. That sin was sexual in nature, and it is placed in the same category as the sin that prompted the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. The transgression was interpreted by Peter and Jude as evidence of despising authority. Despising authority, rebellion against your proper dwelling, your place in God's plan. And so there's no other angelic sin that we can point to in the Old Testament beside Genesis chapter 6. So <clears throat> we come to this, this concept. Now it's interesting because you guys may be aware that there is a something like 270 uh, flood stories from different cultures. 
So there's a lot of cultures that talk about the flood. Now, I don't know how many stories there are like the sons of God, but in Mesopotamia, the area of around Israel, there are an abundance. Now, they don't call them the sons of God. They'll call them the Apkalu, uh, the Mesopotamian uh, um, Demi gods who came and taught men how to do things. This is, this is. Uh, you guys ever heard of the story of Gilgamesh? Gilgamesh. Uh, it's a, it's an old uh, folk story about Gilgamesh who was a giant, uh, who was two thirds divine, one third human. So you have these stories of events. Also, like you had similarly, like you have flood narratives. So there's a, a lot of stories out there about them. Now, the problem is, how's that work? So here's the here's the problem. Here's the problem that comes up in the book of Matthew. Jesus was asked in the resurrection, whose wife will this woman be? She was married to seven different men. And then she died, and they all died, and in, in the resurrection, I'm going to repeat that phrase again, where? In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? And Jesus said, in the resurrection, she will be like the angels who neither marry nor are given in marriage. You, you don't understand of the things that you ask. Now, the funny thing in that story is the Sanhedrin are asking, and they don't believe in the resurrection anyway. So it's kind of a little bit bogus. I want you to realize what Jesus says about the angels is in the resurrection, in the new heaven and the new. When's the resurrection happen? The resurrection happens when Jesus returns, right? The Lord returns and the dead in Christ are raised, right? Are you tracking with me? The resurrection occurs, the resurrection of life, um, the resurrection of, of the dead uh, who don't believe, they're brought to life and they go to the great white throne judgment and they go to the lake of fire. The believing resurrection, they come forth and they go to the new heaven and the new earth. So Jesus is saying there's no marriage there because nobody ever dies there. That does not mean that angels who can appear as human beings can't do the things human beings do. That doesn't mean I don't have any questions. I still got plenty of questions. But I'm just going by what it is that the word says. Here's the truth about what the word says. Angels did something with man. It caused God to bring the flood. They didn't only do it once. They did it twice. And the angels who were involved, God took and put them in chains and has them reserved in darkness until the judgment of the great day. So the rest of the angels don't do it anymore because they don't want to be in chains any more than you do. <clears throat> so so th that doesn't occur anymore. And it created... A clan of people who went to war against the people of God. And you're going to read those stories throughout the Old Testament of the giants fighting with um, the people, uh, the people of God. I think I got a couple of those stories we'll look at uh, real quick. Um, when we try to wrestle with the idea, who, who are the Nephilim? Who's the, who are the fallen? Well, now let me say this. Um, Michael Heiser did a, wrote a book. Uh, he's a doctor of uh, Hebrew, uh, Old Testament languages and uh, Hebrew culture. And he wrote a book called Reversing Herman, which he uh, deals with Genesis 6. It's an interesting book if you're interested in it. It's kind of a... Uh, exciting read to go through. Um, one of the things he says, there's, there's two possibilities for this. One is the angels somehow had intercourse with women and they produced 
a fallen offspring, which God told um, Moses and the children of Israel to wipe out everywhere they found them. Two, that the fallen angels who became the false gods in all these other cultures uh, utilize their own power, their supernatural power. I have no idea what power an angel has to create a people who became giants and they never, it was not through intercourse. So all the Bible tells us, it uses the, the illustration that this, this is what happened. Let me give you an example. God called Abraham and said, I'm going to make a nation of you. And God made a nation of him. Two people who couldn't have children had a child in their old age. And that child led them to what we know today as the nation of Israel. In a similar way, fallen angels, uh, with I don't know what their abilities are. I'm not saying they're equal to God in any stretch of the imagination. But one angel can kill 186,000 men. I I don't know what else he can do. He can appear as a man. He can disappear. He can fly. He can go between dimensions. There's a lot of things he can do. And if you and I saw one, uh, we should remember what the scripture says to test the spirits because not all spirits are good. Even Satan masquerades himself as an angel of light. So perhaps they manipulated the gene pool, whatever, I have no idea what they're capable of doing. But what I know is the fallen angels created a race to wipe out the people of God. To stop the birth of Messiah so that they could disrupt God's plan of the redemption of man. That's not news, right? Remember when Jesus was a baby, what did the king do? He tried to kill all the babies, right? So he could get rid of it. Do you know once in the line of David, the line of David only had one small infant left? And if, if the enemies of the purposes of God could have killed that one infant, they didn't. But if they could have, in their mind, have they foiled the purposes and the plans of God? The seed of the serpent will be at enmity, at war, with the seed of the woman. There's a battle that takes place kind of behind the scenes, but you, you know who the players are. When you get to the Valley of Armageddon at the last battle, you're going to have a hard time knowing who's the good guys and who's the bad guys, right? It'll be clear. It'll be clear who is the seed of the serpent, the Antichrist and his armies, who's the seed of the woman, Christ. Right? Who's going to deliver from the sword that comes forth out of his mouth? So you can see this play all the way through. My point is the beginning of it is Genesis 6, 1 through 4. The beginning or another part of it is Genesis 6, 1 through 4. I guess the beginning of it's the first murder, but moving after that. Moving, moving forward. Now the angels kind of get a little more proactive. So when we talk about the Nephilim and the Anakim and the Rephaim, uh, Numbers 13.33. Uh, you guys who have been reading the one-year Bible should be familiar. Uh, and, and there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak. So they become the Anakim. Anak's sons. Anak, I am, is the plural. The Anakim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seemed like grasshoppers to them. So I'm not saying they were as tall as buildings. I'm just saying, I don't know about you, but if I ever was in a room with Shaq, I feel like a midget. That's a big man, right? And Og, the king of Bashan, I want to say was like 13 feet tall. So that, that makes Shaq look small, right? Five feet taller than him, that's a lot. So uh, it goes on, Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 20. It was also counted as a land of Rephaim, for the Rephaim formerly lived there. But the Ammonites called them 
Zam Zumim, a people great and many and tall like the Anakim. Remember, the Anakim was a race of giants. But the Lord destroyed them before the Ammonites, and they dispossessed them of their and settled in their place. So the reference in Deuteronomy is, oh, remember the Rephaim. So what you're going to have is, as we go through time, however the giants were in the beginning, they're going to become more and more man. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And he, uh, he puts the uh, Ammonites there. So the Ammonites are bad people too, but they're not giants. Uh, Deuteronomy 3, 1 through 11. And we turned and went up on the way to Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Edrai. But the Lord said to me, Do not fear him. I have given him and all his people and his land into your hand. And you shall do to him as you did to Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon. So the Lord our God gave into our hands Og, also the king of Bashan, and all his people. We struck them down until there were no survivors. And we took all the cities at 